this was not all that there was. There was a lot more. You would think that I started World War III. But there's a reason why I predicted Carlos Sainz to lose to Lando Norris. As you're watching this, as we go through it, just remember, it is solely to explain why Lando Norris was chosen over Carlos Sainz in the 2020 season. If I had one objective of this video, it is to level set the expectations because they are unrealistic right now for Carlos. When we walk around saying he's best of the rest plus one, I don't think the story is as clear cut as everyone thinks it is. Complicating this dynamic that carried over from 2019 is Carlos's great performance at the 2020 Italian Grand Prix. And I think that if we all just take another deep dive into this, maybe you'll change your mind, maybe you won't, but at least you fairly assess the situation and I can do what I can to make that happen. But for now, in this video, we're gonna focus solely on the 2019 data and the curious case of Carlos Sainz. Now then, onto the story. And as we go through this video, you'll notice that I'm telling it in two distinct parts. Part one is gonna be all about the performance aspect that Carlos saw. And part two will be all about the narratives that were playing out around Carlos Sainz that really affected his 2019 numbers and the performance as a whole of the midfield. Which brings us to a good starting place. Let's take a look at where things are now and set the stage. Sainz draws even on qualifying head to head after his Monza performance, which he converted to a runner up finish. This marks his third straight quali win, which was much needed given Lando's three consecutive Saturday successes the previous stint. And when Lando happens to win on Saturday, he's 0.22 seconds quicker on average compared to 0.16 quicker for Carlos. And for his efforts, Lando has seen one more Q3 than Carlos at 8 to 7. As for the championship standings, Norris now leads Carlos 57 to 41 through round 8. He has an average finish rate excluding DNFs of 7.0 versus 8.1 for Sainz. Relatively speaking, reliability has been there, at least compared to 2019. They both have had some issues, but Carlos Sainz more than Norris this year. Just as in 2019, he was unable to even start the race in Belgium, and he also suffered a tire blowout. And while that was affecting more than just him on the grid, it didn't happen to Lando. Both drivers have one fastest lap under their belt, Norris in round one and Carlos in round two. And another important thing to get out of the way just right now, I will not be ticky tack counting points. I won't be saying 10 points here, eight points there. If it's a mechanical failure and if it's important, I'll mention it. And when it's unique to the driver, I'll mention it. But outside of that, I don't believe in counting points and working backwards shoulda, coulda, woulda. And there's too many things that we'd have to adjust and assess in order to compensate for that. So this is a good segue into Lando's season and specifically why it's surprising so many this year. But if you're a friend of this channel, you knew it was coming. And I'm sure there's many of you out there right now saying, what about Carlos's horrible luck in 2020? Not great luck, sure, but horrible, no. Not statistically significant or out of line with any other midfield car. He's had some less than stellar pits and reported some cooling issues, but this is not parody to a first half meltdown to the tune of three retirements of a possible seven Grand Prix. These are the types of numbers Lando was dealing with in 2019. So here's a stat. In 2019, Hamilton completed 100% of the 1,262 laps during the 2019 season, an impressive feat that's only occurred nine times by eight drivers, himself being the repeat performer. On the other hand, Roman Grosjean was hit with by far the worst luck. He was dead last in the number of laps completed with 1,043. And while he'd be the only driver not to break the 1,100 mark, Lando Norris wouldn't be too far ahead of him. He was P19 with 1,102 laps over the entire season. Through round seven, he would fail to finish in China, though he was still classified P18. In Spain and Canada, he'd go on to make that a fourth retirement before he even reached the break when his MCL 34 lost power on lap 26 in Germany. Over the season, Carlos Sainz would incur four DNFs in which he would be classified in one, P19 in Bahrain. And on aggregate, Norris would incur two more DNFs. Meanwhile, things were going much better for Carlos. His poor luck would pick right back up after the break, but after that he would return to form. The back half of that season especially, he did just about all he could. His awareness and his instinct to understand the type of race that he needs to put together after seeing the cars in front of him fall, it's effective, and it led him to capitalizing on some missed opportunities from front teams. Japan and Brazil being the best examples of this. In the six races that Norris was eliminated from scoring, Carlos would rack up 14 unanswered points, and this would come in Spain and then in Germany. This compares to the single race where Norris scored where Carlos was excluded from scoring himself. And it was nearly two races except Norris would be denied in Spa in the cruelest of fashion as his car would sputter over the finish line with just one more lap to go. Worse still, he was running in a comfortable fifth place on for 10 additional points. And this was the difference in the McLaren issues in 2019. When Lando's car failed, he would complete 62% of laps on average before his ultimate retirement. And of the six retirements, only two were under 40% of laps completed. This was in Canada, and then again in Germany. 
The major outlier to this general factoid was Spa. Even given his unlucky streak in 2019, retiring after 98% of the race complete seems rather unfortunate. And that 10-point swing would have a factor in the championship results and the inter-team battle, but such is racing, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video. And this takes us to my ultimate conclusion when I looked at it last year. What happens when Lando gets even moderately better luck than his abysmal hand dealt in 2019? What happens when those cars in the fringe actually start to have some instability? It's possible. We look at Red Bull last year, and who could forget Ferrari this year? So this video thus far has addressed Carlos's 2019 performance. We've discussed how Norris may have had some more painful moments, but Carlos had his fair share nonetheless. But that's just one small piece to this puzzle. The other larger and more compelling piece is centered around Red Bull and how Sainz's 2019 took advantage of available points he normally wouldn't have had available to him. And again, I'm emphasizing, I'm not here to dilute the efforts, but the fact is, had it not been for the chaos at Red Bull and their driver problem, he wouldn't have had the room for these such results. And don't worry, we're going to get into the data and prove it. Let's upshift to a more empirical approach to explain this. And to do that, we go to none other than my favorite stat, percent of points earned. All it is is an objective way to measure a driver's performance. It's not a performance measure that should be used by itself though. Let me say that loud and clear. It should not be used by itself and I try not to use it with anything less than one full season of data. You need enough data points to even make this viable. The model also forces you to input some manual assumptions and I'll call them out so you can input them yourself on the fly or you can do it later. Just anything so you don't have to be forced to adapt mine. Here are the three main inputs you should consider. DNFs, so reliability or collisions, don't change numbers. A high or low percent of points taken can highlight reliability issues, but it requires you to actually look and diagnose it. Secondly, it's unable to account for any sort of outside influences. For example, if there's a clear one-two hierarchy within the drivers on the team and one driver is getting favorable treatment, it would be unable to decipher that just from looking at the data alone. And most importantly, it makes no assumptions about whether a car belongs in the final spot it lands in the championship. And the two immediate hypotheses that are pretty reliable that you can count on either to be disproven or proven once you go look. Number one, the cars in front really left doors open and he took them, most likely through unreliability. And number two, his car was a lot better than 10th and he scored much higher but just bottled it more often than not. Now I'm simplifying that of course, but now you know where to look, at least where to start. And after this video, I challenge you to do a percent of points analysis down in the comments. Pick any driver you want. You can either challenge this analysis we're about to do on Carlos Sainz or Pick anyone you want to look at. Let me go ahead and offer up Sebastian Vettel. I know his data is pretty interesting. Or have a look at Max Verstappen. I know his data is interesting as well. All of that explanation was crucial to the next part of the story. You ready? Let's do it. For his P6 drive, Saints would tally up 96 points. Given his P6 position, over the course of a season, he would have averaged 8 points per race. His total available points would have been 168. This would make his percent of points taken 57%, or said in real terms, so of the available points he had up for grabs in that season, if we assume that he drove at a P6 level all 2019, he would have taken just north of half the points he could. Gut reaction would say, that's not great, but of course, let's go deeper. Without context on the drivers in the same proximity, that stat lacks any sort of real punch. Here is the list of drivers in their percent of points taken in the 2019 season, and this is all excluding the fastest lap. And as you can see, Carlos's 57% is the lowest of the grid. I myself was curious if this was just a product of where the midfield usually lands. Maybe those fringe drivers suffer from a lower percent of points taken. And so I did what I always do. I dig. And as it turns out, those midfield fringe cars, quote unquote, that is the drivers that finish anywhere from P4 to P7, when you look at it, it doesn't hold up. In fact, it paints that 57% in worse light. It looks like even more of an anomaly. Only twice under these current regulations in this era has a driver ranging from P4 to P7 finished capturing less than 60% of points available. Go ahead and take a guess who that other one is. And I'll give you a hint, it's from 2018 and it's exactly who you're going to think it is. Yep, you got it. It's Nico Hulkenberg with 55% of points available taken. But the slight difference is, his 2018 effort, which was good enough for 69 points, he finished in P7, and in many ways, this is perfect to explain the 2019 situation with Carlos. As the turbo hybrid era continued, with each new year, the gap from midfield to top three cars grew wider and wider. There became less of an opportunity for a Formula 1.5 team to mix it up. This trend would start to become more and more pronounced when we saw Ferrari in 2016 clear the next best team, Force India, by 225 points. Perez would be the best of the rest in consecutive years. 
Raikkonen's 186 points were good enough to be P7 and 84% clear of Checo in 2016, and then Max would move 68% clear of Checo the following year. Nico Hulkenberg would be best of the rest in 2018, beating Carlos in the process, but he'd fall behind Ricardo's Red Bull in P6 by 146%. Ricardo had famously abysmal luck in 2018, but despite missing so many races, it was mostly Hulkenberg who would step up in those P6 places he left open. Magnussen would have the next best record at scoring P6 or better, as he'd have four instances of doing so in Bahrain, Spain, France, and Austria. And using percent of points taken as a diagnostic tool, the first thing we look at is reliability as we talked about. So it just so happens that the cars who would mix it up with the top teams were mostly the two cars that had the most amount of mechanical issues. Magnussen would have the largest swings and performances for many reasons. Hulkenberg would DNF and thus be excluded from seven races that season. I said that this was a good example to contrast 2018 due to the fact that Red Bull cars had so many failures, mainly Ricardo, and this would represent the opportunities for drivers to step up and take positions that they normally wouldn't. This presented itself in 2019 in the form of Pierre Gasly. Now, I won't be talking about the merits of Gasly's specific performance. I won't be talking about the reliability issues for the most part, and I won't be talking about anything that may or may not have been unfair to him in terms of his treatment by Red Bull. So if I seem nonchalant or cavalier, it's solely to stay objective and stay on point about Carlos Sainz. Preparing for the story, I got a baseline read from all of you in a survey, and you ranked McLaren as the fourth best car, which of course is one of the most critical inputs for percent of points taken. And here is one important editorial assumption. Based on this info and what I think of Gasly's driving, I concluded it could be reasonably expected for him to get sixth on any given day pending reliability. And we're talking in the Red Bull car. So keep that in mind. If you don't put Gasly as sixth best driver on the grid in that car, maybe you think he's better than Max, maybe not. Maybe he's worse than McLaren, even though their car is likely worse. Then you have to account for that. But that's what I assumed. Of the 12 races Gasly got in Red Bull, he would finish five of those races P6 or better with one retirement. So if he finished the race, it was a coin toss as to whether he'd put the car in the position it belonged. Moreover, when Carlos Sainz and Gasly both finished the race, Carlos scored better than Pierre on three occasions. He did so in France, Germany, and Hungary. In those first 12 rounds, Carlos would score P6 or better 42% of the time. This includes the two occasions where Gasly would actually still score better than Carlos in that respective Grand Prix, and those were Monaco and Silverstone. And while I believe Carlos' season was solid, some important moments slipped by him and the drivers behind him capitalized. And it's these moments that make it especially difficult for me to get on board the hype train when it's driven by so many people just looking at the results sheets. And you can see this specifically play out in five Grand Prix of Gasly's 12 race tenure at Red Bull, when A, he'd finish, and B, he scored seventh or worse. In Australia, K-Mag would earn a surprise P6, his best result of the season. In Bahrain, Norris would take the sixth best spot. Azerbaijan would be Gasly's first retirement of the season, but it was Perez who snatched the open spot, not the next likely car who should have been Sainz, who finished just behind Perez in P7. In Canada, Gasly's P8 was not taken by Carlos, who finished P11, but Daniel Ricciardo, who finished P6. And in France, Gasly's lone point at his home Grand Prix left the door open for both McLarens to finish better than his Red Bull and even Hulkenberg in P8. And this last instance takes us to Austria, where Norris would match his season best, taking P6, beating both Carlos and Gasly. Theoretically speaking, if a position is available directly in front of you, the next best car should inherit that position, especially given the extent of the performance gap and how hard it is to sneak into the top six. I previously laid out the data to prove the gap from the midfield to the top three was larger than ever. Hulkenberg's separation of 148% in the 2018 season only slid to Vettel having 150% more points than Carlos's P6. And this trend is only going to persist until the regulations change or a team utterly collapses. Thanks a lot, Ferrari. As cars get better, their advantages continue to increase exponentially over inferior cars. And this is not a conversation or commentary about the fact, it's just a fact. And for proof, look at the 2019 season. In these five instances we just talked about, how many times did someone who came in the top five of the driver's championship finish any lower than their position, any lower than P5? Zero. All right, now for fun, let's expand it. Just see what happens. How many times, if you take those top five drivers and expand it, not just those five races we talked about, all 21, so 125 instances total, how many times did those drivers finish below the self-contained P5 little situation we have going on in today's grid? Go ahead and think about it. I'll give you a second. Okay, you got it? How many? 10. That's 10 times. You heard that right. 10 of a possible 125. That's 
8%. And that's including all of the times that a driver didn't actually even finish the race, but they were still classified. I still included that. So it's pretty impossible to just pop your head in and out of the top five. Thus far, we've done a couple of important things in terms of setting this up. We've laid out briefly how Lando's season was written off slightly. Because comparative performance is so important in forming the one next to your teammate, we at least needed to touch on those moments to at least show that while Carlos was unlucky, Lando was a whole heck of a lot more unlucky. And if we were looking at 2020, the same would be considered. But we've also taken a brief look at Gasly's season as it compares to Carlos. The final piece to all of this, and arguably the most important piece, is Alex Albon. Let's transition this analysis to focus on the back half of the season once the swap occurred and Albon took the second Red Bull seat. And we kick things off with a very powerful data point. He would never finish below P6 for the remainder of the season, aside from one very unfortunate incident. Ironically, in Brazil, the very fact that Hamilton took out Albon is what led to the podiums of both Carlos and Gasly. Furthermore, over the course of those nine Grand Prix excluding Brazil, there would only be six individual instances where a car that finished behind P6 in the championship would even manage to score P6 or better. I'll have the details right here on screen. Albon's ability to put the car where it was supposed to be with greater success than Gasly found made it difficult for Carlos to improve his position. But I'd be remiss to not mention the fact that he did take advantage of key situations. Vettel would retire from Russia and he'd fill the P6 spot behind Albon. The collision between Leclerc and Verstappen would allow Albon to usurp Leclerc, but Carlos would still take the open spot in P5 in Verstappen's absence. And finally, he'd stay in the fight and capitalize on a dramatic conclusion to the Brazil Grand Prix for his first ever podium. When we look at the percent of points captured post Spa, Carlos's metric suffers a predictable drop, but the fall isn't that pronounced. While Sainz enjoys a 60% points capture rate while Gasly's in the seat, it falls to 53% when Albon gets the Red Bull job. This is driven in part by a few things. Carlos's back half DNF record would match that of the front, that is two Grand Prix each, but the difference is the denominator changes. In the back half, he's got a higher propensity to DNF, considering he failed to finish two of a possible nine Grand Prix, which equates to a 22% rate, as compared to a 17% retirement rate in the front half. And another factor that was a headwind to his performance in that 2019 season in the back half was he had four Grand Prix where he'd finish, but he would still fall below his average, and these were in Singapore, Mexico, US, and Abu Dhabi. Albon's average finished position of P6 once at Red Bull equated to 76 points across nine races or 86% of his total season's points haul. I have no doubt that given the full season with Albon driving in that manner, he would have finished the World Drivers' Championship in P6. And as it should be, he had the better overall package in 2019. Now, it's no secret that Marinello expects results. They have the resources, they have the tradition, the heritage, the pride, and they normally have the cars, putting their drivers in positions that give them a better chance than not at delivering on what the team needs. And that's titles, championships. But looking at 2020, I'm not so sure that Carlos is going to have the pace out of the box like he'd probably like. And you got to remember, Leclerc has improved massively on race pace. Not to mention his one lap advantage on Saturday, he's lethal. That's in no way meant to discount or discredit Lando's one lap pace. So Lando, if you're watching, which you're not, that has nothing to do with this. That is just to say that probably shouldn't be losing to a rookie. And I'm pretty sure you can ask Fernando Alonso about that. I guarantee you that still stings. But unfortunately, that's not going to improve any next to Leclerc Ferrari, despite the car they have. If anything, it's going to expose that fact. And if we don't reset and recalibrate the 2019 season, we are setting Carlos up from a position which he cannot walk out of Ferrari with a better legacy than he walked in. But don't take my word for it. Look at Sebastian and how he's being treated right now. How do you think Carlos is going to be treated if he walks into Marinello with the world thinking he can beat cars that are better on tech? better on performance and better in overall packages, but he's somehow beating them, just like he did in 2019. Ultimately, if you give Carlos Sainz a great car, he will give you solid performances. He will put in a good drive and he will give you great results. He's a phenomenal driver. But if I had a nickel for every single time I heard best of the rest plus one, or he's so underrated, I would literally not have to put ads in these videos. And you could be saying, Nick, you're making a mountain of a molehill. No one's saying, I, I promise you, you are underappreciating the situation. How many times have you heard that Fernando Alonso gets the most out of every car? He gets more than any other champion. He just doesn't. There's no empirical evidence to back that up, but just one thing at a time. I promise you I will be talking about that soon. For now, Carlos Sainz needs a readjustment. I will happily accept being the heel on this one if all it does is to reset expectations for Carlos as he walks into the lion's den, probably at the least opportune time for fans to take another good hard look and set fair expectations. 
I am whatever this F1 community needs me to be. But I will not watch another driver get demoralized, cast it aside through rigid, miscalculated, misguided expectations that should have adjusted in real time. Hopefully I've proven that this is not in any way, shape, or form a referendum on Carlos's 2018 season. If anything, it's a referendum on data analysis. I'm trying to protect Carlos in a way. I'm trying to have people look at this again. I'm not trying to convince you it's not good, simply that it's worth another look. And with that, that's all I have for now. I'll see you very, very soon.